flow, uh, we're looking at the stress eraser, a feedback device to control stress. I'm Chris. I'm on Captain. I'm Andrew. I'm Mike. No, I'm Dave. Does this work for switching slides? No. no. Okay. Uh, so the stress eraser is a portable and uh, simple device for measuring uh, heart rate and breathing cycle, which users can use to measure stress during different activities. Um, so the measuring is of uh, oxygen saturation of the blood. It's using a pulse oximeter as a sensor. The processing is done uh, using algorithms to get the uh, respiratory sinus arrhythmia, and it, then it outputs the sinus respiratory arrhythmia. Uh, so it's measuring the oxygen saturation rate, which varies with uh, pulse. Um, this uh, change in pulse is an indicator of uh, parasympathetic neural activity, which is a rest and digest phase of homostasis, uh, compared with the complementary sympathetic neural activity, which is fight or flight response. Okay, so, uh, Oh. All right, uh, so. So we have our sensor, which is basically a pulse oximeter. Now, here you can see uh, the blood oxygen saturation level, which is 99% of the sinage, and your heart rate, which is 3. It utilizes uh, laser emitting diodes to detect changes in the content of the blood. It, it utilizes um, two different measurements an absorbance measurement to detect changes in your blood set in the oxygen saturation in your blood. And you have a reflectance factor, which measures the changes in your finger volume due to your heart rate. So signal processing works by uh, programming, where it converts your heart rate taken from the absorbance readings into uh, an RS, RSA wave with uh, frequency analysis. Uh, certain algorithms developed by the company have been implemented into this device in order to get a much finer and easily interpretable graph to uh, come <coughs> So here you can see our out output display. Um, it's basically kind of like the interface of the device. So you have daily points here, um, which indicate the success of that therapy session. Um, basically, the, be the less stressed out you are and the better you're breathing and controlling your stress, the more points you get. So, the triangles indicate the positions of the peaks that you're supposed to observe while you're um, trying to de-stress yourself, do uh, homeostasis. Uh, up here, you can see that there's a brief record of your past waves. So these first two little dots correlate here. These next two dots correlate here, et cetera, et cetera. You have squares right here that actually rank your breathing cycle based on how stressed out you are. So three squares means that it's very good. You're doing fine, you're calming yourself down, keep going. And two means that there's been some kind of slight disruption, which could be an angry thought or a, a quick stressed out situation. And here, as you can see with the extremely jagged peaks, you only get one duck. And these dots correlate to the amount of points you get. So three dots is one point, two dots is half a point, and one dot is no point. Okay, so here's some uh, basic background about the pulse oximeter. It was developed by a professor, um, Glenn Allen Milliken, who ironically died from hypoxia, which we will later, we will later understand the irony of that. Um, it began as a, the project began as a dual wave colorimeter that measured blood oxygen levels, and this slowly evolved into what was known as the pulse oximeter. So uh, his his project it was financed by the Fellowship of Trinity College at the University of Cambridge. Um, his prototype, the first prototype, was known as the Milliken oximeter, which uh, the prototype was attached to the earlobe for it to take the reading. Um, they used green light to uh, take this measurement when attached to the ELO. And um, one problem was that uh, they, this was before the time that they discovered that earlobes absorb green light really, really well. And uh, the only reason it was still able to function properly was because that the light emitted, it was uh, invisible infrared, and that was unaffected by the green filter that was used within the, um, the Milliken oximeter. And the patent was issued back in 
September 26 of 1942. So here is how a, a pulse oximeter works. What it does is it shines an infrared wave of frequencies uh, through any type of membrane that it will be recording of. For example, your fingertip or your earlobe, for example. And it, it, the wavelength is at approximately 660 nanometers. And the infrared light will be shined at 905, 910, or 940 nanometers. Uh, the absorbance readings, they will vary with each individual heartbeat. And um, because, because there's a, a lot of noise within the frequency of the blood running through your body, this, uh, what, what the pulse oximeter will do, it will focus on only uh, a certain area of those frequencies and um, it, will only, it will only focus on the, the oxygen that's being pumped through the blood, I mean through the heart, and it will only capture those absorbances within that range. So this is, this is the, a really good um, percentage of the range of saturation. It's, um, it's between 95%, 95 and 100%, but sometimes you get low as 90. Like, like I said earlier, it's, it's often connected to the fingertip or earlobe, or in the case of an infant, their foot. And, um, and this is very important. What, what the pulse oximeter does, it, it does not detect the efficiency of the oxygen uptake, only the changes in the oxygen content of the arteries. Okay, so, um, so here are some of the uses that we might use for the pulse oximeter. It can detect oxygen saturation and pulse. Um, it's, it's very commonly found in, in hospitals. It's good for detection of oxygen within the system. And uh, earlier I stated that the professor died who, who, uh, who made the pulse oximeter. He died from hypoxia, which was a lack of oxygen. And uh, so if, if he had already developed that pulse oximeter drug, we would have been able to you know, help himself not die, but <laughs> <laughs> that's the irony. So now, now within new technology, we have wireless pulse oximeters. And these are extremely useful when performing surgery because they're able to attach them directly into you know, whatever they might be cutting open. In this case, we have a colon being surgery. Sur 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 so <coughs> as, as they're performing the surgery, they're able to, to monitor all of the oxygen uptake. And, uh, and this is important because a lot of times in surgeries, um, the newly the newly stitched or operated on uh, organ is not is not consuming enough oxygen to to um, sustain itself after the healing process has begun, and this can lead to um, this can lead to uh, ruptures, oncoming stitches, and uh, <coughs> most most of the time, or here's one case of an stomach bowel connection where where the colon is bended and reattached directly to the anus. And um, if, in this case, this, this, uh, the wireless pulse oximeter will be very important because uh, if it does not heal properly with the right amount of oxygen, it can lead to rupture, stitching, or even leakage of body contents. So here's uh, just a, a short list of problems that are associated with hypoxia, whether as, like, uh, as a result of hypoxia and uh, can result in hypoxia. So uh, like uh, altitude sickness, which is uh, with uh, the professor, that's where he was actually uh, climbing Mount Everest when uh, he passed. Uh, premature birth can also result in uh, hypoxia with the, the baby as it grows older. Uh, tumor hypoxia, cystic fibrosis, uh, an increased blood pressure, which also relates back to the stress tracer. Uh, sleep apnea, you uh, <coughs> stop breathing uh, while you sleep. Uh, a faulty heart, um, unusual forms of chemical and sickle cell anemia, as well as a uh, Norris case death. Uh, so basically, uh, the electric cardiogram or ECG is going to be the, the gold standard of the pulse oximeter and the stress tracer. As you know, it, uh, the ECG is going to measure your heart rate by touching leads uh, on the body and we need to the monitor as well. And it's usually done within a uh, hospital or a clinic. And this is also considered to have an extremely uh, accurate measurement of the, the body's uh, heart rate. So the stress tracer uh, is understood by uh, industry to uh, help in the reduction of stress. 
and the, the only thing that hasn't been, that wasn't really tested was the how accurate it actually was. And so uh, there was a study done to, that compared the, <coughs> the results of an ECG with a comparison of the stress racer. And this was done by, uh, and this uh, study showed that there was a, a slight but almost negligible difference uh, between the heartbeat intervals and uh, RSA waves. And <coughs> the stress razor uh, was uh, can't really calculate the pulse as well as an EC, uh, as well as an ECG as I do. And this is due to uh, a peripheral vascular resistance and uh, mechanical wave properties. So the basic conclusion of this was uh, that while the stress razor was accurate, very accurate um, and portable, it's about the size of uh, a deck of cards, it's not as accurate as the uh, ECG was. Uh, but many uses for the resonator in a oxygenated. It's used in like uh, sleep studies, and it's also used for therapeutic applications. Uh, one sleep study, for example, uh, we used it in transient to something, uh, which is basically a, a sleep study to in, improve improve. Um, Features uh, studies. Uh, it was in combination with poly uh, something like that. Uh, so before the <coughs> so it was actually used in the study, uh, no major change was was uh, accountable in the amount of time it took to sleep, and the controls actually showed that the sleep disturbance was uh, was more before the sleep. Uh, sleep. And after the stress eraser, the, the patients actually were able to go to sleep more easily. Um, another study was was actually comparing the, a person who had a, a slow heartbeat and a person who had a faster heartbeat, basically um, athletes versus non-athletes. Um, it had the, uh, the two people in different positions. Either uh, a person was laying down or he was standing up. Um, when the person was laying down, in the, supine position, uh, he experienced more parasitic activity. And when, they, and when the two patients were standing up, they both had the uh, equal parasitic activity. Okay, so um, to uh, give all final instrumentation with some credibility, here are some quotes um, of everyday people. Uh, uh, one quote was from a business professor. He says that he actually uses the stress ratio, uh, it says it's the best matrix available to measure, monitor, and control its stress when you teach this, uh, this stressful uh, uh, business program. And, and, uh, and a doctor actually gives it out to his patients when they are stressed. So in conclusion, the stress ratio is a very effective environment instrumentation uh, device to control your stress and monitor it. It's Portable, it's manageable, it's you know a very small device, um, and it's easily accessi accessible in such uh, stressful situations, and uh, the everyday person can actually use it. Um, now we do have a wireless pulse accelerometer um, currently in, currently in use today, but we would like to um, do further studies to improve the technology. And because it, it, it really is a good measurement of oxygen content. And these are Do they have questions for them? Um, where would you get more accurate readings of the earlobe or the fingertip? The earlobe or the fingertip? Mm -hmm. um, it's actually a bit difficult to say. Um, they're both relative, well, I wouldn't say relatively the same person. I'd probably say the earlobe actually, because it has less uh, less vascular resistance than when compared to the fingertip, which is all the way out here, um, in comparison to your heart, which is much closer to your earlobe. To add to that, also, um, it depends on like, the thickness of the membrane, like you're trying to measure through. So because your, your ear is relatively like, you know, thin, it's, it's more than 